Well, good evening and welcome to the latest edition of The Definite Article, where we discuss a recent article or publication by an IA author. I'm Saeed Kamal, the IA's Academic and Research Director. On Tuesday, the government announced the lifting of lockdown restrictions from the 4th of July, and a snap poll was shortly afterwards found that 64% of the British public agreed with the easing of the rules for the venues which have remained shut over the recent months. But then another poll in terms of timing found that 40% of people think it's coming too soon. Others have criticised the government for the prescriptive nature of some rules. For example, you can go to the pub, but you can't stand at the bar. The plumber can come, but don't make them a cuppa. Uh, new IA report out today titled The Economic Value of Human Life, or Is the Lockdown Worth It, forms the basis of this week's definite article. Face. Maintaining lockdown deepens the economic wound, but would start, stop, start, stop, start, stop, start, stop, or even just start, stop, stop, again pose a greater risk. And also, it's not just a question of when, but also how. The Prime Minister has insisted NHS test and trace systems were in place to respond to fresh COVID outbreaks. But what civil liberty implications are there for, uh, for these track and trace apps? Now, joining me today are IA's uh, economics fellow and author of Coronavirus and the Economic Value of Human Life, uh, Julian Jessup, as well as the IA's Head of Regulatory Affairs, Victoria Hewson. Julian and Victoria, thank you for joining us this evening. I uh, wonder if I could start with you, Julian. Let's start with your report, mm -hmm. your briefing paper, and also a CapEx article. Um, you talk about tragic choices need to be made in terms of health economics, ones that ultimately boil down, boil down to put a monetary value on a human life. But how do you arrive at that? And how do you arrive at that in a way that people don't accuse you of being harsh and lacking feeling? Well, it's, it is, as you suggest, an extremely difficult and, and, and sensitive issue. And it, it is hard to, to write or even think about these things without apparently offending somebody. So I'm, um, I will tread carefully here. But I think there are, there are a couple of examples that are useful to outline some of the issues. So um, suppose, for example, you had the, the awful responsibility of um, allocating the, the last seat uh, in a lifeboat as the Titanic is sinking. And you had a straight choice between allocating that seat to a healthy young child or, or a sickly old man. Um, I think most people would allocate that seat to the to the healthy young child. And uh, that, that is an example of the sorts of judgment that you sometimes need to make. Um, the second example, which is where you actually have to put a monetary cost on something, is that suppose you had a, a new medicine or a road safety improvement that, that might save somebody's life or, or prolong it for a few years. Um, if that costs, say, £10,000 per patient or per life saved, then I think we'd all agree it's worth it. Um, but what about £1 million? Or what about £10 million? What about £100 million? Um, I think there has to be some number at which uh, anybody would start to balk at the sorts of money that needs to be spent to, to save that life or, or, or to prolong it. So um, I think when people think through those examples, they do recognise that sometimes these difficult decisions do need to be made and putting a monetary value on, on one life and giving it perhaps a higher value than another is a reasonable thing to do. Uh, and this has been a, a standard thing that's been done in, in health economics for, for, for decades, if not, if not longer. Um, often health economists use something called a quality, which is a quality adjusted life year. And, and that's the idea that, you know, uh, the sort of monetary value you might place on, on a year's life in, in, in good health. Um, so if you had a, something that saved lots of people's lives who are relatively young and relatively healthy, uh, you might be willing to spend more money on that or, or to make more sacrifices elsewhere. Uh, then if you're looking at something that might save the lives of a relatively small number of people who are already old and perhaps with life-limiting conditions or other health problems. Uh, and that, as you can see, is where coronavirus starts to become a challenge because we, we now know with a high degree of confidence that the people most vulnerable to it are the relatively elderly, uh, often with pre-existing health conditions. And I think that has to affect your, your assessment of the, the measures that are being taken to, 
uh, shutter the economy, but also other things like how quickly you might want the children to go back to school or younger people to go back to work or to shop or to, or to open their businesses again. But you talk there about the trade-offs between uh, choices of people of different age. You talk about the fact that the elderly seem uh, uh, more susceptible. Um, I think the, one of the stats says that the disease's average victim is the age of 84. Um, but when we look at this, that, are we guilty in some ways of overlooking the unidentifiable victims, those whose lives will be lost or impacted by the policy response to COVID? So, for example, there are, ex uh, there are stories of uh, cancer units uh, having, unable to see their patients, uh, for example. You know, how does the profile of the typical victim also affect the cost-benefit analysis? Well, I think so that's a, another very important point, another very important problem with doing a cost-benefit analysis of, of any intervention here. Um, there's a natural tendency to, to fall into the trap of what's sometimes called the identifiable victim problem. So, so we, if, in conditions of uncertainty, we, we naturally focus on the things that are uh, most obvious. So you know, people dying of, of COVID uh, quite rightly have received the, the, the most attention in the early stages. Uh, but the flip side of that is we probably don't pay enough attention to some of the less visible costs, um, both uh, economic and non-economic. So the, the not directly economic would be things like the impact on, on mental health, you know, the, the fact that children, for example, are uh, not getting the, the education they normally get, so they're missing out education opportunities. Uh, there may be patients who, who don't have coronavirus, but who have other conditions who, for one reason or another, are not getting the treatment they would normally be getting. So those sorts of harder to, to measure costs. Uh, and then the economic costs themselves. I mean, they, you, know, you, can, you can put a number on some things like you know, GDP, uh, but it's debatable whether that's really a meaningful measure here. Um, you can put a number of things like jobs that are, are being lost, but then even then you need to ask the question, are those jobs only temporarily being put on hold or will the economy quickly snap back? Um, but the key point here is that you, you can't just assess this in terms of the, the impact on the health of those most at risk from coronavirus. You have to think about all the other costs, some of which may be significantly less visible than others. Now, Victoria, uh, you heard uh, uh, Julian there talk about the economic costs and some of the non-economic costs. And I understand that you've been talking about one of the non-economic costs in terms of the cost to, our, cost to our freedoms. Do you want to elaborate on that? Yes. So I think Julian's paper is a really good read and he explains these uh, quite difficult concepts really well. And But I think there's another non-economic cost uh, involved that is even harder possibly to, to value than the costs that Julian's just talked about. And that is the cost to our freedoms of having laws in place rushed to Parliament with very little scrutiny um, by MPs, periodically um, amended so that oftentimes people didn't really know what the regulations were at any particular time, including the police, quite frankly, who've not really covered themselves in glory in terms of actually understanding what the restrictions were that meant that people were required not to leave their homes, which is an extremely serious, unprecedented incursion into people's freedom, not allowed to leave your home without reasonable excuse. And um, I think, you know, there's a good argument, there's an interesting judicial review uh, in progress in the courts at the moment going to be heard next week, where the claimants there are arguing, one of the things they're arguing is that these restrictions on um, freedom of association, freedom to practice religion, freedom to uh, conduct family life, all of these things are disproportionate potentially, because did the government really properly consider other ways of achieving um, the reduction in the risk to health that didn't have to necessarily involve these incredibly restrictive uh, laws backed by criminal sanctions that stopped people moving about this country in a way that was really quite unprecedented. As I say, uh, it's not a criticism at all. These things are pretty much impossible to put an economic value in for the purposes of doing that kind of economic analysis. Um, but I think they really shouldn't be forgotten about in, in the calculation. And it also illustrates really why the idea that politicians should just follow the science in making these kinds of political choices is, is um, frankly a bit ridiculous because there's no way science could tell you how to, to weight up all of these different factors. Um, Julian, I wonder whether we can go back to sort of the economic impact. And, you know, on the one hand, you say that the longer the lockdown continues, the greater the risk of permanent economic damage. 
On the other, if we eat it too soon, we risk sacrificing some of the gains made and stop, start, stop again could be worse. Which argument, in your view, carries more weight as we enter month four of lockdown, given that economics is about trade-offs? Yeah, I think it's quite reasonable to say that the, the balance of costs and benefits changes over, over time. So if we think about the, the benefits of the, of the lockdown first, and that, that's primarily, of course, the, uh, the lives that might be saved and, and health that might be protected. And there, there'll be other people who are far greater experts on, on this than, than me. Um, but I think there is you know, growing evidence that um, the longer the, the lockdown goes on, then uh, the more marginal those benefits are. Um, we, you know, we are getting to the point where uh, we are hopefully closer to a vaccine. If we do get a second wave later in the year, we'll be much better prepared for it. Uh, the NHS has been able to cope. Uh, if anything, there's now too much spare capacity in the NHS. You know, people are not getting treated as they should be for, for other conditions. So I think there's evidence that the, that the benefits of the lockdown are, are diminishing over time. Uh, but it's certainly true that the costs of the lockdown are increasing over time. Um, it's one thing to, to have a sort of one or two month shutdown of the economy. Um, where the majority of businesses, jobs and incomes are protected. I mean, that, that's almost like a, a sort of a hibernation or a holiday, uh, an enforced holiday. But um, I wouldn't view a you know, temporary fall in GDP for that reason alone um, in the same way as I would a, a prolonged and, and deep recession um, where you do get massive job losses, uh, permanent scarring, as people are now calling it. Um, making it much, much harder to, to restart the economy. Uh, and in the long run, you end up with a, you know, a smaller economy, possibly higher taxes, possibly lower public spending, certainly making it harder to, to fund the public services and, and infrastructure that we, that we rely on. So um, while I think it was quite reasonable at the start of the lockdown to say that this was an appropriate and proportionate response to, uh, to what we were possibly facing, particularly given all the uncertainties, I think it would be quite reasonable now to say that the balance of risks has, has shifted uh, and the government is right to sort of gradually ease the lockdown you know, as the health data permits and so far it has uh, and to try and make sure that if anything now it errs on the side of lifting the, the, the lockdown sooner rather than later. Uh, now that, that's, that's my personal view but that, that's what I also argue in the paper. Well let's ask you Victoria, what is, what's your personal view on that? Should, did you agree um, roughly with what Julia was saying? At the beginning I understood it all but now as time's moved on, it's time to ease it? Or have you always been a hawk or a dove? And where are you now? Well, no, I think I, I, I do agree um, with, with Julian's position broadly. My qualification is that while we certainly should have treated the virus with extreme seriousness, I certainly don't buy into these ideas that it was a hoax or no worse than a dose of flu or anything like that. My, my main criticism of the, the lockdown measures really going back to my previous point is that it was done by way of force of law and arguably because people had already started to adjust their behaviors and were already working from home and the pubs were already empty and um, you know people were traveling much less and people were um, shielding elderly relatives etc my argument would be perhaps we didn't need those draconian regulations that were prohibiting people from leaving their homes, perhaps as the direction of travel is now, this could all have been achieved by way of guidance. Um, because as I say, people had already started acting on the information they had and what they were seeing in other countries like China and Italy and were adjusting their behavior accordingly. So my, my sort of, I don't know if this makes me a hawk or a dove, um, but it, <laughs> my view would have been you know, absolutely, we did need to undertake social distancing and potentially it was correct to shut down um, social venues where people were crowding closely together and to, 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 to stop large gatherings. But I think we went too far with the, the really draconian restrictions on personal freedoms. Victoria, you, uh, you uh, mentioned a couple of other countries there, China and Italy. So let me ask you about the uh, evidence or the experimental evidence by other nations. Are we paying enough attention to them as they ease their lockdowns? And what lessons can we learn? Uh, you mentioned China, Italy, maybe other countries. Well, that's, that's a great point. And it's been noticeable that over the past weeks, um, you know, people, especially in media and social media, have been really keen to, to bash the British government by reference to other countries, like especially Germany, for example, which is, you know, really, relatively speaking, dealt with this crisis very, very well. Um, 
And um, however, as soon as we start lifting, the, or rather, as soon as Germany starts lifting the lockdown, which they did weeks before us, um, and other countries too um, in Europe have had, um, you know, they've reopened bars quite a long time ago and restaurants weeks ago. Um, as soon as the government starts moving in that direction, suddenly we don't really want to follow what Germany's doing anymore. And, and the government's being criticised um, again. Um, so there's a bit, I think it's a bit unfair sometimes the way international comparisons have been made. Julian also makes the point in his paper that oftentimes the data between different countries isn't particularly um, comparable for, for various other reasons. Um, so I think we absolutely should be learning from what other countries do. And it's, it's, an absolute, it's, you know, it's a vital part of the response. I would also highlight as well that even within the United Kingdom, the, the differences between how the, the, the nations of the United Kingdom have, have reacted. We can also learn from that. Um, you know, for example, um, Wales and Scotland had some even more draconian rules and guidance than we did in England. Um, they legislated the, the two metre rule into law in Wales, whereas the two metre rule, as it's been called, was never actually a rule or law in this country, and it still isn't. It's only guidance, whereas they legislated it into law in Wales. Um, you know, did that really make any difference to the health outcomes in Wales, or was it just a, an added layer of um, quite restrictive lawmaking that the Welsh government put in to differentiate themselves? So there's loads of lessons to learn on, on all levels, really, and we absolutely have to do that. Julie, let me ask you about international comparisons. You know, some people hold uh, up New Zealand as an exemplar to us all, but then others point out, well, hold on, it's far away from anywhere else. The population density is very low. They're more sheep than the people, for example. Mm -hmm. you know, they don't have such density in, in urban areas as we do in many of our countries. So where, where are the useful lessons and where is it? where should we act with caution when making international comparisons? Uh, well, I think that's a, that's a good starting point. That the, there are many different reasons why a country might have a, a different track record on coronavirus apart from just government policy. Uh, I mean, New Zealand, for example, you said had a, had a head start because it's a small country a long, long way away. Um, um, Sweden actually had some advantages too. So, you know, relatively healthy population, um, a relatively small average household size. So you would always expected them to do relatively well, even if they hadn't um, opted for a relatively liberal approach to towards um, the coronavirus itself. Uh, there are also lots of problems with the, the data. I mean, it's a, it's a well-known e problem in economics. The moment you start focusing on any one particular number, it immediately loses any meaning. Uh, Germany has provided a very good example of that actually over the last week or so. We'd all been focusing on the, the R number, the, the reproduction rate. So that's roughly speaking how many people each person with coronavirus then goes on to infect. That rate had been below one, which is great. And then suddenly it shot up to, to nearly three. And everybody was panicking, saying that Germany had eased the lockdown too quickly. Uh, but that was very much a sort of localised outbreak in essentially one factory that had caused that number to surge. Uh, it was still that number, though, that, of course, led the, led the press coverage for, for several days. I think some newspapers are still talking about it now, even though the R number has since dropped back again below one. So uh, there is good evidence out there, but it it's, has to be interpreted with, with a lot of care. Um, another example interesting worth watching, though, I think, is, is the US. Um, now, the US, of course, is also easing it, its lockdown, and we have seen you know, some quite significant increases in the infection rate here. Um, but I think there's another difference there, which is that the communication around the easing of the lockdown has been really poor. So you know, I'm not going to come here and, and you know, bash Donald Trump and plenty of other people are willing to do that. But you have a climate in the US where you know people are having face masks ripped off them and, and things like that. And they're that is a climate where people are suggesting that coronavirus is a, is a fake. And I think that sort of thing is, is extremely helpful. So th there are a number of things you have to get right. I mean, first of all, the, you know, the, the measures themselves, the, the official measures, um, but also the messaging around that, because I think a lot of this is about confidence. Um, there is a risk that even if we you know, lifted the lockdown completely tomorrow, if people didn't have the confidence to go out and shop or to go to work or to send their children to school, uh, then the economy would remain depressed. So it's not just about what you do, but also the messaging around it. And uh, I, I know I'm sure in a few minutes we, we can produce some examples of some very odd and, and mixed messaging coming from the government that I don't think is doing anybody any favours.
Well, you spoke about the US and uh, one a number of American academics we've spoken to in recent weeks during the IA webinars, uh, wherever they come from on the political spectrum, have talked about the uh, potential for uh, experimentation and different compa comparisons between different states as they uh, try different routes. But we also saw yesterday, I think it was, New York, New Jersey and Connecticut uh, 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 um, announced that they were going to require people from coming from other states um, to uh, go, go, go into quarantine. And, and also Victoria talked about you know, some of the regional variations here um, in, the U in the UK. Let me ask you about that. Has there been some talk about regional lockdowns, short two-week lockdowns to manage spikes as and when they appear? Mm -hmm. Would you support these, or do they represent yet more restrictions on our liberties? And what challenges might they bring? Uh, well, I'll, I'll have a go first. I think Vic, uh, Victoria probably wanted to comment on that as well. Um, I, I, I do feel uncomfortable about this. I, I think maintaining consent is extremely important, and there, there is a risk here of a sort of postcode lottery. Um, so, you know, if you happen to live the wrong side of a, you know, a road, you might face a different set of restrictions than than if you lived on on the other and I think people feel uncomfortable with that um, it's also difficult to see how that you know that sort of lockdown could apply when people potentially are commuting quite long distances so suppose you shut down parts of London uh, what about people who commute into London so there are there are various practical problems around it as well as well as maintaining consent um, so I, I'm, I'm wary I, I do like the idea in principle of um, you know, rather than a one size fixed all policy, if there is a local outbreak in one particular place, as we saw in that, that German factory, you shut down the area around that factory. But I do see do see practical problems around that that, that could make that very difficult. Well, uh, Victoria, you raised the issue of some regional variations within the UK. Would you uh, be in support of regional lockdowns and a short term, short term, short term regional lockdowns? So I wouldn't go as far as to, to support regional lockdowns, but I do think excessive centralization has been one of the biggest problems in the way the um, the UK government and devolved nations governments have handled this. The, you know, one of the biggest problems we faced right at the outset was testing, uh, which had been sort of controlled centrally with an iron grip by Public Health England. And that really set us back significantly, it's fair to say, because not enough people were being tested, especially, for example, in hospitals and um, old people's homes. And uh, it's fair to say that decentralization in, in those kinds of things, in terms of public health and healthcare delivery, would certainly be beneficial. I probably would hold off giving local councils the right to um, institute a lockdown and confine people to their homes. But I dare say, you know, environmental health and public health functions of um, opening hours and of, of, of bars and entertainment venues and things could be handled at a, at a local level through, for example, licensing laws and, and environmental health. And I think, you know, less centralization in, in that sense is, is probably a good thing. And that's really, to be fair, one of the reasons why Germany has um, handled the, the crisis better than, than the UK has in, in many ways. Well, Victoria, I wonder what, whether I could stay with you and, and, and talk about the uh, announcements on Tuesday and look at those in greater detail in terms of exactly what's being eased and how. Could you share your overall views before I ask you some more specific questions? Yes. So first of all, important to note um, the, the big announcements that Boris Johnson made about coming out of hibernation was England only. Um, the other, you know, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland are doing things slightly differently. Um, but broadly speaking, as, as I say, Boris Johnson announced England is coming out of hibernation. Um, I'll be able to go to the hairdressers in a couple of weeks to my great relief and delight. And um, broadly speaking, all of those um, rules restricting, restricting people's movement and uh, freedom to associate have been lifted, which or will be lifted as of the 4th of July, um, which is which is great news. But it's not quite back to normal the way it is. For example, uh, according to the guidance, uh, I think pubs have to take the names of their punters at the door. Um, how might that, uh, say, ex for example, put uh, them in conflict, or is it open to abuse? No, well, it's very interesting. First of all, you hit on a very important point, even just with the words that you use there. It's guidance. It's not a rule. 
Um, so, and, and actually all of these new, um, well, it's being reported widely on the BBC, et cetera, that there's all of these new rules about how many families are allowed to stay overnight at one time and, and all this kind of stuff. None of that is rules. That's now all guidance, which is why this is sort of being done as a, a common sense rollback, which I strongly welcome. And as I say, perhaps might have been something we could have done from the beginning. In, in respect of this particular um, piece of guidance to um, pubs and restaurants to, to take customers' names at the door, um, it does put them in a difficult position because it's quite hard to know how they could do that without being in breach of data protection laws. So if you're going to keep this list of everybody and their contact details, you need to have a privacy policy, you need to make the privacy policy available to all of these customers, and you need to follow various rules about what you then do with that list. Um, you know, I mean, it's there's been quite a few jokes circulating that, well, if I'm going to the pub, they're not getting my name, I shall introduce myself as um, Spartacus or, uh, or, or Mickey Mouse or you know, whatever, which, you know, I do, I do have some sympathy with that. And I suspect because it's guidance I sus and, and because it's not going to be particularly easy to operate, it might fall away. Um, the difficulty is, of course, with guidance is that even if it's not a hard law, um, failure to adhere to guidance could, of course, be used by authorities to pursue things like health and safety breaches, um, you know, the legal duty to keep your employees safe. So it does introduce some legal uncertainty. Um, and, you, you know, it does also tie into a, a much more general and potentially long lasting impact of this crisis on our civil liberties and the general acceptance, even appetite that the British people have shown for all of these kinds of measures mm -hmm. and, you know, the culture of snooping and snitching that it's encouraged is, um, you know, has not been uh, a, a particularly pleasant um, feature of this crisis to observe so hopefully as the as the fear subsides those particular tendencies will also subside well uh, julian uh, you know you must be delighted you know given what you said earlier about being you know agreeing with quite a lockdown measures at the beginning wanted to see some easing now uh, what, what what are your feelings about tuesday's announcements well i think it's a another big step in the in the right direction um I mean, if I just, I mean, other things are important, but if I focus just on the economy for now, um, we had, of course, that, that massive contraction in economic activity, a 25% fall in just two months. That was, that was unprecedented. Now, arguably, we, we needed to do that if we were serious about stopping people from doing what they would normally be doing, then you'd expect a big fall in economic activity alongside that. But um, we couldn't keep that going. Um, the good news is that, you know, since April, the, the data that we have so far for May and June has been encouraging. It does suggest the economy is rebounding back uh, quite strongly, I think stronger than, than many people anticipated. So we are at least beginning to see a V-shaped recovery um, in the economy. And I think that that V-shape will be uh, solidified as the lockdown is, is eased further. Um, looking ahead, there are clearly some risks. Um, you know, I, I do still have some concern that that V might just be the first part of a W, that you may get a, a second dip later in the year, either because you get a, a second wave of coronavirus itself, though, uh, you know, without being a health expert, I think that that's unlikely. And even if it were, we're better prepared for it now. Um, the bigger risk might be an economic one that you get a second wave of job losses that, um, you know, depress consumer confidence and, and, and spending again. But um, I think we'll avoid that risk because the speed of the lockdown is running rather ahead of the, uh, the speed or the timetable at which the job uh, furlough scheme is, is going to be run down. So hopefully pubs and so on will start opening uh, next month. Um, so that's several months before the, the furlough scheme uh, is, is finally ended. So I think we'll, we'll just about you know, run ahead of the curve there uh, and that should be okay as well. Um, so we could end up the year, at the year with a sort of pleasant surprise about how quickly the economy has recovered. But in order for that to happen, the government needs to frankly get out of the way. Uh, part of that is you know, easing the lockdown restrictions. The other is you know, uh, continuing to, to keep uh, downward pressure on taxes and deregulating the economy and so on. Uh, whereas there are all these wacky ideas for the government to do even more than it is now in terms of um, intervention in the economy and you know employing people and creating jobs and spending enormous amounts of money, which I think would be almost exactly the wrong response. So, so I, I'm 
you know, fundamentally optimistic about the economic recovery, and I think the easing of the lockdown is part of that. But there are there are risks of, of all different types ahead as well. Well, let me ask you very briefly, Julian and Victoria. Uh, one e example, maybe it's a, a minor example, is uh, of the government getting out of the way is that they've uh, reduced the frequency of their press briefings. Julian, how do you feel about that in terms of the signals it sends? Um, I wouldn't necessarily have reduced the, the frequency of them. I think there was still some, some value in them. But I think, like most people, I was getting a little bit tired, partly because you were seeing the, the same old faces. Um, it would be better, perhaps, to have a, you know, a broader range of, of, of people speaking. I mean, maybe not just scientific. three or four journalists asking the same question even though it's just been answered previously so there's a I think a lack of imagination from some people in the media about how they were handling them uh, maybe instead of getting rid of them all together we could have had them less frequently and with a wider range of people but um, I do understand that you know many people were starting to get a bit bored with them so they're losing the impact somewhat. And Victoria how do you feel about the ending of the daily press, press briefings? I mean, in a sense, I'm pretty neutral because I'd long since got bored and stopped watching them anyway. Um, on the other hand, I, I actually think, while I'm all for greater transparency, uh, I don't think ultimately these press briefings have been the best way to deliver that. Um, as I mentioned before, the government had to be taken to court in order to prompt them to release the, the scientific uh, advice and, and minutes, which arguably would have been much more useful than being harangued by Beth Rigby once a day. And, and I think in a, in a way, that sort of theatricality drew a quite reactive set of actions in, in many ways, like wild goose chases about targets for numbers of testing, um, almost really just to avoid or preempt gotcha questioning uh, in quite superficial way by, um, by members of, of the press. So yeah, I won't I won't be mourning the end of the briefings, but I would certainly welcome better, more uh, reasoned transparency. Well, Victoria, I wonder whether as we reach towards the end of the program, we can talk about something you've written. You wrote last week that in response to the news that the NHS coronavirus app had been abandoned in favour of the Apple Google system, that civil liberties concerns persist. Could you elaborate on that a bit for us? Yes. So I've been sort of going on about these um, apps, and trace apps for quite some time with quite a lot of scepticism. Um, you know, there's, we had this debacle of the NHS X app that they tried to develop independently of an Apple Google API um, because they wanted to do certain things differently from what that API would allow. Now, I was actually quite sympathetic towards that, um, although I, you know, don't really agree with what they were trying to do. I could understand that they weren't just being bloody minded and showing British exceptionalism. They had plausible reasons for wanting to do it differently. However, it was pretty clear that it would work for various technical reasons. I also think for what it's worth, I don't really think that the Google Apple API based apps will be particularly successful either. Um, in any no country that's got them up and running so far has had particularly strong uptake and they haven't really demonstrated that it's made much difference so far it's early days but they haven't demonstrated it's made much difference to countering the spread of the infection but my main concern from a civil liberties perspective is not so much around the the, the tracking through the app it's what you then do with that information both in terms of the information being shared within government and used for different purposes and also in terms of the app and the data on the app being used um, to, for example, determine whether you're allowed on a bus or whether you're allowed into the workplace. For example, Tony Blair has very um, clearly advocated that it should become a sort of digital ID and a disease passport. And I think the idea of, of that happening when actually the disease is you know, very much hopefully in remission and we're getting better at dealing with it, sneaking in a digital ID system um, it looks like a bit of a classic example of not letting a good crisis go to waste in order to sneak through quite potential authoritarian measures. So that was, in summary, what some of my concerns were there. You mentioned your, the experience of other countries. Uh, is there anything we can learn from the track and trace in the other nations and what we could probably replicate or avoid? Well, 
So one of the countries that's held out as being one of the best examples of, of, of dealing with track and testing track and tracing is South Korea. And they've been particularly successful, not so much by using an app, but by giving government access to absolutely massive of data, such as data from payment systems and CCTV coverage in cities. So for example, when somebody tested positive in Seoul on a Monday morning, they were able to identify which nightclubs he'd been to and who else was in those nightclubs. And yeah, they locked it down and they shut, they, to be fair, they did shut down the social district of the city as well. But the trade-off there in terms of access to personal data that the state had. Incidentally, it was um, gay clubs, which comes with sensitivities of its own, especially in a rather more conservative country like South Korea. Um, so yes, so certain countries have managed track and trace much better than we have, but they haven't necessarily done it by using an app. And they've certainly done it at potentially great cost in terms of civil liberties um, and state surveillance. So, uh, Julia, just before, before I go to the questions that have come in, I just wonder what I, I can ask you. Have you been looking at following the track, the debates around the rollout of track and trace? And, what, you know, what would you say? Uh, I haven't clearly followed it as closely as Victoria has. And uh, I'm maybe I'm a sort of a, a generation that tends to be rather sceptical about any of these things working anyway. So uh, I wasn't certainly holding my breath for, um, you know, a workable app to, to come out. And um what limited stuff I have read about it suggests all sorts of, of difficulties. I mean, uh, uh, the simple practical problem of, yes, you might be able to say that you're within one or two metres of somebody, but, you know, what, what does that mean in practice? I mean, was there a, you know, some sort of screen between you? Were you facing the same direction? All, all sorts of things. It, it, it never sounded plausible to me. So sort of a, you know, a technophobe or a technosceptic, I, I never held up much hope for it anyway. Okay, well, let, just to round up, let's go to some of the points that have been made on the chat function in uh, YouTube. Uh, first of all, we've got a chat called, uh, it could be a chat, Jez Giant Chicken. Um, uh, he says that the DFT, uh, the Department of Transport, has published an annual highways economic note, which establishes the op op average cost of fatal, serious and minor injury road accidents. The cost of fatality is well in excess of one million pounds, which, which begs the question, why did Jez the giant chicken cross the road? But clearly what, um, what clearly the point that Jez is making here is yeah. that, you know, as, as uh, Julian rightly says, that you know, economists do put a, a, a value on, 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 the, on, on life, and the, a, a monetary value. Next one uh, from Alex Lee asks, experts predict a second wave of coronavirus um, in, in the UK. If the government gave Victorian Julian the powers to dictate policy, I know he uses the verb dictate, um, what would they advocate? Uh, Victoria? I would certainly advocate Public Health England having a long, hard look um, at their record in dealing with this and learning some serious lessons and potentially devoting much more of their resource and effort at actually doing one of their fundamental functions, which is countering infectious diseases and maybe a bit less on nannying people about um, how much uh, sugar they can eat, uh, etc. And um, I would absolutely, perhaps even more seriously than that, we look at how the rush to uh, I don't know, I don't want to say expel, remove older people from hospital beds to free up NHS capacity and the horrific effects that that had, it seems, in moving um, people to um, nursing homes who ended up then spreading the disease, um, causing quite a high proportion of, of the deaths in, in the first wave. So I would say definitely getting the situation with older people in hospital and nursing homes fixed would make a huge difference were to, there to be a second wave. What about you, J Julian? Well, I think the, the first thing to, to say is, is don't do the same again. I mean, if we, if we were to get a, a devastating second wave, then I think it wouldn't make a lot of sense to do exactly the same again as we did the first time around, because in some sense that has, has not worked. Um, as it happens, though, I, I, I think, you know, the, the chances of something as devastating happening a second time are, are, are smaller. I mean, we do now seem to be better prepared. The, the NHS, if you like, has had a, 
had, had a dry run and, and wasn't in the event overwhelmed with, with patients. We are that much closer to um, a vaccine. Uh, we're that much closer, presumably, to, to herd immunity uh, as well. Um, so I think it's important for the government not, not to panic into doing exactly the same thing again. Um, I think it, it is also important to um, make sure that we do learn lessons that we can learn from, from elsewhere, from, from other countries. Um, some of them have seen uh, marginal increases in the number of infections, but they haven't panicked. You know, they have, um, you know, stayed the course and those uh, pickups and in infection rates have tended to, to fall back down again. So um, I think that if there is a sign of a, of a second wave, I think this time the government should err on the side of caution and not do things rather than rush to, to shut the economy down again. Um, I think we, we can afford to be a bit, bit more, not so much complacent, but a bit more sanguine about a second wave compared to how we responded to the first. Well, Julian, I wonder whether I can stay with you for the next question from Rizhab uh, uh, Haria. Who's, uh, sorry, sorry, Glyn Brailsford, sorry, I apologise, Ms. Hub. Um, it seems thousands of people have been flocking to beaches today. Mm. How confident are you that people will exercise their restored freedoms sensibly? Well, this is a, a, a problem that was discussed um, back in March before the lockdown was introduced. I mean, where there are several arguments against a lockdown. One is the idea it might be a good idea to get herd immunity. Uh, but the other was the idea that if you kept a, the lockdown in place, after a while, people would lose patience with it. And I think that is very much something that has, has happened now. I mean, you can, we can debate about exactly wh what the trigger for that was. I mean, some people, of course, would, would blame Dominic Cummings. Other people might look at the, the Black Lives Matters protests. Um, others would simply say, look, it's beautifully sunny weather at the moment it's impossible really to to keep people in but um whatever the exact driver i think i think it is clear that you know public consent for uh, continuing with the lockdown has, has has long since gone um the, the opinion polls you mentioned earlier suggesting that you know, most people do approve of the the lifting of the lockdown even if there's some disagreement about exactly how quickly it's it's happening so i think it's important therefore that for the government to sort of get ahead of this and recognize it can't continue to keep such large parts of the economy locked down much longer uh, to focus on lifting the restrictions on those parts of the economy where uh, the health risks would be would be the least, which is pretty much what it is what it is doing. Okay, um, and what about uh, uh, Victoria? Well, I think um, this is all part of the learning experience, of course. And I think one thing, speaking very much not as a scientist or an epidemiologist, that we've noticed is that um, it seems like the um, there's the localized flare-ups that have been happening, for example, in Germany and also in this country. Um, was it somewhere in Wales, I think, or, or um, in the Midlands? Have happened in uh, confined spaces, in uh, refrigerated, um, I think they were all meat processing plants. Mm -hmm. So on that basis, you know, these are the kinds of things that people um, sort of learn about and uh, also the authorities and, and health authorities learn about and so on that basis uh you know god i hope i'm not wrong and it turns out there's a massive flare up in bournemouth in a couple of weeks time but it does seem at the moment that people are in some senses absorbing information and exercising common sense because we kind of know now the virus spreads particularly in colder spaces and confined spaces where people are um, associating closely together. So on that basis, arguably, people flocking to beaches aren't really acting irresponsibly at all. Um, you know, time will tell, perhaps in a couple of weeks, there'll be a, a terrible outbreak in, in the southwest of England, but, but hopefully that won't be the case. And if it is the case, it's, uh, it's something else that we can put down to, to, to learning and getting better data about it all. Um, and uh, Victoria, you are being praised on the chat. It's, uh, someone says it's a really good point about the API. The press has spun the NHS X at the debacle as British exceptionalism, but you've tackled that head on. So uh, praise indeed. Um, I think it's probably about time to wrap it up. Uh, we, you know, we've been good for about 45 minutes. Can I thank both uh, Julian Jessup and Victoria Houston for joining us tonight? Can I also thank our viewers uh, for joining us tonight? Um, all our uh, on online content can be found on our YouTube channel, IA London, we are, uh, via which you are watching at the moment. Uh, please do hit the subscribe bell, um, and also please do subscribe, um, view our, our other online content. Um, if you want to listen to our, um, our podcasts, they are also on IA London. The audio versions appear 
on Podbean. Um, and during these difficult times, uh, if you do have a bit of money to spare, no matter how modest, uh, please do consider making a contribution uh, to the IA at ia.org.uk. And that enables us to keep offering our online content for free to our viewers and listeners. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. You'll find more of our content on the IA London uh, site. And also don't forget our next um, definite article will be Monday. And we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you very much for joining us. Good evening. Stay safe.